Okay, welcome back. Uh, this is going to be the second part of the lecture today on gender and sexuality uh, in the 1960s in the United States context. Um, specifically, as I'm going to share my desktop here, in from Stonewall to the present. I'd like to um, lay, lay out some of the um, uh, concepts or, or terms that we're going to be using in this class too, uh, particularly as we move into a contemporary or a more um, actual context from today. Um, in, I'd like to begin, in other words, um, with this point of contrast between Spain and the United States of what's going on in the 1960s, as we mentioned in a previous class. So first of all, we, I'd like to address a definition of something, uh, which is identity politics. Um, this is something that we refer to, we often hear in the media uh, too, used and misused and misunderstood, uh, but I wanted to define it specifically. This definition comes from the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, if anyone is interested in, in uh, the source. <clears throat> identity politics is uh, understood as a mode of organizing that is intimately connected to the idea that some social groups are oppressed. That is that one's identity, for instance, as a woman or a Native American, among many other examples, makes one peculiarly vulnerable to cultural imperialism. That means kinds of stereotyping, erasure. That means also silencing or appropriation of one's identity or group identity too, as well as violence, exploitation, social marginalization or powerlessness generally. The identity politics starts from analyses of oppression to recommend variously the reclaiming, redescription, or transformation of previously stigmatized accounts of group membership. So rather than accepting the negative scripts offered by a hegemonic culture or a dominant culture about one's own inferiority, um, one transforms one's se sense of self and community, often through consciousness raising. This is the idea. It's a very dense definition uh, that's a very complete one, actually. Um, so uh, we're going to be discussing this in the future, but I wanted to lay forth these, these ideas here. And now, the identity politics typically focuses on subjectivity, the notion of not the individual per se, but this notion of the subject. Um, subjectivity and one's own subjectivity as it's created, as it's negotiated. Um, in other words, subject, subjects that are particularly um, vulnerable to violence, oppression, or domination, um, it, but always focusing on the possibility of um, upholding a shared, more self-determined alternative, or in other words, a more empowered alternative. So this is what we're going to be talking about, of course, in relationship to um, uh, how identity politics has come about in the mid 20th century uh, in its many forms, um, and very specifically to uh, what this has to do with media. Okay, but before we do, um, I wanted to, um, let me move me out of the way if I can here, identity politics and talk about intersectionality. We said this road sign in the upper right hand corner, um, yeah, that has in, uh, different questions of racism, sexism, heterosexism, um, classism, colonialism, ableism, right, which is a form of discrimination that favors the able-bodied or the healthy. Um, in other words, this intersection between these, these concepts or between these forms of discrimination is what we refer to as intersectionality. That's what I wanted to discuss with you. So what is intersectionality? In, in identity politics, we understand that existing systems of oppression, of domination, or of discrimination overlap. In other words, um, they exert violence upon subjects in intersecting, intersecting ways. And it requires us to take into account the multiple identity formations um, at once. In other words, we have to take into account when we talk about identity, we have to be very, very specific about locating that identity, that subject position. In other words, we can't talk about all working class individuals in the same way, in the same way that we can't talk about all people of color in the same way, nor all women in the same way, nor all gay men in the same way, um, or trans individuals and so forth, nor all Christians. And here, as you see, I'm going through each one of these, which is social class, race and ethnicity, gender, sexuality, religion, nationality, 
even age. We can't talk about all um, what's been referred to as so-called boomers in the same way, um, in, or disability, right? And the idea of um, in, the question of, of um, uh, different ableist statuses, right? In other words, we have to take into account intersecting ways in which um, um, in these identity locations are specific and particularly understand, let me show you here, that in, these are not accumulative um, factors, um, in, but these are entangled forms of oppression that intersect and interact with each other. So what I'm getting at here when I say, when I say this is that it reminds me of a film um, in, in uh, Paris is Burning, which talks about people of color in the 1980s and 90s in New York, um, and particularly cultures of resistance among the LGBTQ communities, among people of color um, in, in, uh, in New York. Um, it, and we see that one of those forms of resistance were the drag balls or um, in, in drag queens and, and other kinds of drag kings um, and competitions that would take place. And in this movie, it begins with an interview of one of the uh, members of this community. Uh, and he says, in, my father always told me I had two things against me, that the, one is because I have a strike against me because I'm, because I'm a person of color, I'm black, but I also have a strike against me because I'm gay. So although this can be respected as a, um, as a position, we don't understand identity politics to be cumul cumulative. In other words, it is not that he is a person of color plus he's gay. These, these are like somehow units that are stacking up in an accumulative way. It is that the forms of homophobia that he might experience are also racist. And that the forms of racist that he experiences can also be homophobic. So what we're getting at here is that these are entangled forms of repression classist or classism, sexism, racism, homophobia, transphobia, but also ableism and so on. In other words, different forms of discrimination overlap and are entangled within each other. They're not cumulative. In other words, in order to understand um, uh, how racism can also be sexist or how homophobia can also be, or how transphobia can also be classist, um, and so on. In other words, we need to take a look at intersecting um, uh, um, components to understand what intersexualism is. You know? Okay, so where do we get this idea from? Well, um, uh, Kimberlé Crenshaw has put it forth in law and in an ample body of literature and particularly in the legal context. But um, aside from, um, uh, or actually building upon, um, uh, Kimberly Crenshaw's work, we see that this actually dates to prior to a concept that we see in, in um, second wave feminisms. It says here, for instance, in the black feminist politics of the Combahee River Collective, um, and I'm going to quote the manifesto. It says, as children, this group of women says, we realized that we were different from boys and that we were treated different. For example, when we were told in the same breath to be quiet, both for the sake of being ladylike and to make us less, uh, less objectionable in the eyes of white people. In the process of conscious raising, actually life sharing, we began to recognize the commonality of our experiences. And from sharing and growing consciousness to build a politics that will change our lives and inevitably end our oppression the idea again of recognizing forms of oppression and, and making that awareness uh, be formed, form the um, a platform or the basis from which to create an alternative future or to, uh, to, to create change, right? So what we see here is precisely uh, intersectionality um, in its, in its in definition at work. In other words, mothers or families are raising uh, their girls and girls of color to um, specifically, one, be ladylike, behave, disciplining them in terms of gender, gender roles, but also, two, in terms of race, not to be objectionable to or call attention of, of the predominant culture in this case, which is of white people. And so we see, in other words, that this, this entangled form of disciplining and it is, is one that, that takes into account both gender and race together. We cannot segregate them. That's the idea, that you cannot divorce those two concepts without treating them together. Right? That's intersectionality.
Okay, so let's talk about some basic gender definitions. Um, in, when we talk about gender, in, we have to have some, um, uh, some, some basic presumptions on board. And here I'm gonna give you six in, uh, to be able to discuss this in terms of the, um, uh, the, the representations we're seeing, um, in, which might or may or may not necessarily correspond to the body of literature we have in, in sociology, among, um, in, in representation as well in media studies and so on that understands um, how gender is represented versus um, yeah, the sociological characteristic of gender. So let me see here, there we go. Okay, so first of all, when we talk about gender identity, we are referring to a person's internal sense of who they are as a gendered being. Somebody might say, I identify as man, I identify as woman, I identify as trans, um, in, or really anything else. But the idea of a gender identity that <clears throat> they identify themselves with, it's a deep-seated sense of self. Now, the gender binary is in an idea that gender is strictly an either-or category. In other words, it's male versus female, or that it's somehow masculine versus feminine, um, rather than a more a broader, more complex spectrum. And in this is, gender binary is one that's upheld in uh, many cultures today, uh, but it is in its, it tends to be, of course, a hegemonic model in the United States as elsewhere but it's not the only one. In other words, we understand that um, in the world, there exist several cultures, whether Southeast Asia, uh, indigenous cultures in Australia, um, or even in, in North and South America today, where there exist more than simply two genders. Um, in, in other words, there exist uh, sometimes three or more. Um, in, this is not unique and that we tend to presume that there exists a gender binary that is cast as a universal and that's actually false. Um, and so that's something that we should, we should uh, always keep in mind is that gender binaries um, are um, something that is upheld by this notion historically of how family has developed in Western industrialized societies, but it is certainly not the only model. Okay, so Gender expression and gender presentation is how a person chooses to um, uh, present themselves in gender or present themselves outwardly, um, it, which usually is, is a combination of different characteristics that are visible. This is where representation comes in, right? In other words, um, their gender expression or gender presentation is one that um, deals with or relies on hair, maybe hairstyle, dress, uh, mannerisms, or body gestures, and so on, as well as vocal inflection. Um, all of these um, components that are cultural components that would allow the, um, a given society to be able to recognize a gender presentation as um, an identity, as a given identity, whether man, boy, girl, um, woman, in, but also perhaps a trans, non-binary trans, etc. Um, and gender expression does not have to be congruent with a person's gender identity. In, in other words, somebody who uh, inherently um, if feels or says a sense of self as man does not necessarily, their gender presentation doesn't necessarily have to correspond or their gender expression doesn't have to correspond with that identity. Okay, now this is all very something different than biological sex. Biological sex is ultimately what a medical profession determines um, at birth. In other words, the sex of an infant upon birth is usually categorized along the gender binary, male versus female. In fact, it, I believe it's only really in Germany today where there exists a legal term um, if for, in, uh, for infants to be categorized um, as, as a third sex. And that's something that we're gonna talk about in a minute. Um, but biological sex is ultimately what um, um, gender presentation parties um, fall into, this notion of being able to have the, of course, the ultrasound and then announce prior to the birth of the baby that it's a boy or it's a girl. And then, of course, the once born, the biological sex categorizes it within that. It's either one or the other, right? That's, that's the gender binary. 
but that's not always the case. In other words, we know biologically uh, there are um, in, in incidents, of course, along this spectrum where uh, there exist intersex infants. Intersex is a category that describes a person or a subject, an infant, uh, but then later in adulthood or um, a long development of a person whose body or genitalia cannot easily be defined along this binary. Intersex is not transgender, um, but intersex is more of a biological circumstance in which um, if there are subjects who are born that are in between or someplace along the spectrum. And so um, in what we see or have seen historically, um, and this is why we're calling this to attention, <clears throat> is that sometimes intersex subjects or infants are um, if surgery is performed on them to make them fall within the binary. In other words, to make them only male or make them only um, female according to genitalia. But then of course those subjects along development um, and puberty and adulthood sometimes identify with a wholly different gender identity or deep-seated sense of self than their, than their gender reassignment ultimately, than their biological, not biological, but gender reassignment at birth. So we're seeing, in other words, that intersex is um, of course a, a biological um, and developmental category, and that is different from say transgender. Okay, so transgender and cisgender. Transgender, refers to a person whose gender identity does not match their assigned biological birth, uh, se biological sex at birth. And a cisgender person does. Right. So if I had to identify um, myself, for example, to, to give you an example, for instance, um, if I would identify as a cisgender gay male uh, that grew up in a middle class family um, in, in the United States. Um, and that would be sort of like my own gender review of my own gender identity, you know? Um, it, my gender expression is one of, uh, that corresponds ultimately to, um, it, my gender identity, right? In this sense. So, but it doesn't necessarily have to, right? So we see, in other words, that, um, it, this notion of, um, it, gender, transgender, cisgender, and so forth, um, it is a separate issue than intersex, for example. So we're going to continue talking about this. Okay, so what are some basic principles then of gender identity and sexual orientation today? To give just a few here. Let me see. What? There we go. Let me move up here. Okay, so identities we understand them today are not fixed categories. They change over time and they change from one culture to another. So for example, in, identities aren't necessarily fixed categories. In other words, one isn't, uh, doesn't identify for life as the same thing. Think about this, in a developmental stage, you're a different person than you were as an adolescent, and you're a different person than you were as a child, or even an infant. There might be certain characteristics in common, but ultimately you change over time. You develop in different ways over time. And so even if somebody is, say, for instance, has a strong seated sense of, um, of their gender identity as being um, within a given category, say, or of, of, um, of, of any of these um, identity formations or subject positions, they're always subject to change over time, and particularly um, as people move through different social contexts. What we also should keep in mind is that to be, for instance, um, a working class, uh, a, let's say working class cisgender um, lesbian woman in uh, the United States, in a very specific area of the United States in Northern California, say, is not the same experience or culturally the same as being, this, as being that gender identity in Spain. Um, in other words, we see, of course, that, gen that, uh, the, that identities are cultural constructs um, and, and they're unique in different ways, in different cultural circumstances. Oops, keeps beeping on me every time I, there we go. Okay, so um, I also wanted to mention too that our language to use to talk about identity changes over time. So I want to point this out because in, um, 
offense shouldn't necessarily be taken if we take a look at the, uh, the language uh, or the acceptable going language of a given time that the community or different subject positions accepted, which today are considered to be unacceptable. So for instance, in 1969, during the gay liberation movement, gay referred to LGBTQ. In fact, the word homosexual referred to LGBTQ, which is in what we see as an umbrella term. And then also, we see that sometimes the, the use of the term transsexual, which today is often considered, of course, a, an offensive term or an incorrect one and so forth, is one that um, was used to discuss in uh, the transgender community within the gay and lesbian liberation movement of 1960s, late 60s and early 70s, um, and then it would only later become transgender. We should keep this in mind because language changes over time. Okay, so today though, the most common term or the most accepted term, and again, this has continues to change too, is uh, LGBTQ or LGBTIQ plus, um, which is a, a, an agglomeration of different identities of lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, as well as intersex and queer or questioning individuals and communities, which is why there's a plus at the end because it also recognizes that there can be others added to this, questioning allies and so on. Mm -hmm. Okay, so a person's sexuality is not determined by their gender, nor is their gender determined by their sexuality. This is probably pretty intuitive, but it's stated in a theoretical way. In other words, a person's sexuality is not determined, let's say a person is not necessarily heterosexual because they were born male or female, right? Or a person is not necessarily um, in, uh, in that biological sex, let's say if somebody then in their gender identity identifies as a man or a woman, somebody is not inherently heterosexual because they, they, ident because they identify as a man, clearly, right? Um, nor though is gender determined by sexuality, the other way around. Okay, and recent studies, um, very much in, uh, which was actually published um, just this, uh, within a, the past year, Science Magazine, um, and, uh, recent studies confirm what we already knew in the sociological literature, and particularly in, in, in behavior, behavioral studies. In other words, um, sexuality and gender are not necessarily biologically or genetically determined. In other words, there are cultural factors and social factors that make up gender and sexuality um, in ways that, um, that, that make it more difficult to pinpoint any kind of genetic factors that absolutely determine. And in fact, what, the, what science is telling us is that there aren't exactly. There might be indicators that can help influence, but ultimately they don't necessarily determine a given gender or sexuality. It's really interesting. Because again, it tells us that um, gender and sexuality, although what people have can have a deep seated sense of self, that the actual manifestations of that sense of self change over time and that they're culturally and socially constructed. That's what we already knew. But nevertheless, the science is already telling us that and the science particularly that was looking for a so-called gay gene, right? Or in other words, looking for determinants within homosexuality um, yeah, that could potentially explain um, uh, homosexuality from a genetic or biological standpoint. And of course we found that we can't. That's why we're, we talk about construction and representation. Okay, so where, do, um, where does the gay liberation movement come from? Here you see um, on the right hand side, uh, uh, gay liberation march in the early 70s. Well, let's talk about the United States and what's going on in the 60s. We've been talking about Spain, but let's talk about the US. So in the 1960s, we have the emergence of, really the 50s and 60s, we have the emergence of new social movements. This is something that would extend almost, um, sort of erupt from the late 50s into the 60s and the early 70s. So it's quite a, a period of time in the mid 20th century. And it extends to today. So new social movements, or what sociologists call NSMs, um, are black civil rights, the second wave feminist, environmentalist, as well as indigenous peoples and Chicano movement, um, is sexual liberation and gay and lesbian movements that are arising in the mid 20th century. 
In other words, it is a, a form, new form of cultural protests that are vying for specific equal rights around identity positions, whether race and ethnicity or gender and sexuality, nationality, and so on. Right? And sometimes even ideologically, such as the environmentalist positions or ecological um, positions. What's interesting to note is that new social movements are arising all over the world in, um, in ways that resist uh, a paradigm of world rule that had been established um, after World War II. In other words, we see that new social movements are arising in particular in democratic countries where they uh, democratic countries where uh, there were certain liberties secured or presumably secured for the general population. And yet, nevertheless, you have within those um, it, new social movements and protest cultures that are challenging the hegemonic order um, and vying for equal rights, particularly where those liberties or liber um, uh, freedoms um, are uh, not necessarily structured in equal ways. Beeping again. Let's see to get a hang of this. There we go. Okay, so these movements, what they did was they, they questioned traditionalist values and dominant social norms. They questioned hegemonic cultures, right? The predominant cultures in a given society through unconventional forms of political participation and action. In other words, they were taking new forms, they were taking to the streets with new forms of political action. What does that mean? Well, these new social movements displaced social protest from the economic realm as it had been for the past 150 years. Um, all through uh, the 1800s and the beginning of the, of the 1900s, those forms of social protest coalesced around the factory, the workplace, in other words, around workers' rights and around um, broadly class struggle. In other words, around questions of exploitation of farmers, um, exploitation of factory workers, abuses of rights, um, you know, low wage labor and so forth, child labor um, it, that were taking place in the world. And so suddenly there's a displacement of those actions of say striking, picketing and so forth from the economic realm exclusively. And we begin to see new forms of protest taking place in cultural areas, in the media, in public interventions, vying for recognition and equality. You get how this has um, something to do with the chorus. We're talking about the creation of media. And that's precisely where we begin to see how new social movements are creating their own media. Um, in the Black civil rights struggle is a perfect example. Um, if we, if you'll allow me to take this detour for a moment, if we go to, um, hold tight, I think I need to um, share my desktop with you again. Dun, dun, dun. Let me see. I'm going to share my Google. Here we go. Okay, great. So if I show here, I'm going to show you here. Compartir. Great. Okay. So if you, um, in, wait, I think you can see this, right? Is that right? Let me show you my, my entire desktop. Yeah. Okay, Google Chrome. Share the, there we go. Okay, so in other words, if I show you, for example, let's just go to Google very quickly and let's look at um, uh, Rosa Parks. If we look up Rosa Parks, who you're probably all familiar with, and we just take a look, let's take a look at the images online of Rosa Parks. We see this stock image of her, which is an iconic image um, of uh, Rosa Parks in, sitting before a white man on the bus during the black civil rights, um, or ultimately was considered to be a figure of black civil rights um, in movement. In this photograph is produced after the fact, in other words, nobody was there with a the camera to actually take the moment or the photo of the moment when Rosa Parks refuses to um, give her seat to a white man on the bus and therefore is arrested. Now, clearly, her booking photo is also a major. In, uh, you see this sweet old lady um, in holding a booking number and circulated, of course, and sparked indignation. Um, and it shows us, in other words, um, 
how the the civil new civil uh, excuse me the black civil rights movement but other new social movements are creating their own media necessarily vying for public visibility in other words that this photograph was taken itself as a symbol of the movement and that was necessarily done that's what we see in other words protest movements create their own media okay so let's go back here let me see here Bum, bum, bum. Let me share this presentation with you again. Let's see. I think you can see this now. Yes. Okay. Great. So. All right. Okay. As we were saying before, <clears throat> in other words, we see that political movements are no longer um, exclusively organized within the parameters of social class. In other words, it's no longer a question of workers movements exclusively. We begin to see that collectives are organized around identity issues. In other words, black civil rights and equality for people of color, uh, gay and lesbian liberation movement and so on. Right. I, this is what we refer to as the sort of the origin of identity politics and its history. And then finally, we also see in the wake of this that there becomes a shift in protest action and interest to bodies, to the corporal experience, the bodily experience of social subjects and their identities, precisely because these identities are become the sites of political struggle. In other words, the bodies of women are the sites of legislation, for example. Uh, abortion laws or otherwise, or forms of um, uh, political repression and so forth. No, in other words, we see also this a question of blackness or people of color, Hispanicness. Um, in other words, this the question of bodies themselves and social subjects um, or their identities become the sites of political struggle themselves. And that's certainly the case too with the LGBT struggle. Okay, okay. so What's going on? In Stonewall in 1969, there is a precipitous event which is considered to be a, one of several pieces of the gay liberation struggle, but the, there are others around it and also going on in, say, um, San Francisco, Los Angeles, is elsewhere in the United States and in the world. But the Stonewall uh, riots would be the piece that would ultimately kick off the gay and lesbian um, a liberation struggle. Um, and we see, in other words, that um, it, the background to this is that in the United States, there were persecutory laws um, against so-called uh, what was referred to as anti-sodomy laws. Um, and there were no protectionary laws against hate crimes or blacklisting or homophobic violence. In other words, um, in certain states in the civil code, you would see um, it, that there were laws against sodomy. Now, let's, be, let's have a moment and talk about this. Sodomy in some of these civil codes is defined um, in, often as any kind of a sexual position or sexual engagement that was not a, um, heterosexual vaginal intercourse. Okay, so in other words, sodomy is uh, not necessarily defined as anal intercourse. It's actually uh, quite it's a broad, much broader definition than that. And so nevertheless within this interpretation we see that sodomy um in comes to comes to define specifically the stigma of somehow particularly uh, gay male uh, sexual uh, encounters and nevertheless it actually is much broader in in the, the legal interpretation at least and in the lgbtq community uh, this what it does ultimately is it not only stigmatizes the community but it also cont contributes to um, a lack of protections um, and even a justification of hate crimes or violence against them so <clears throat> Back at this time, we see, of course, that same-sex meeting places, of course, LGBTQ <clears throat> subjects existed, of course, and, and met each other and had relations, but they often had to be underground. They had to be clandestine. So there were same-sex meeting spots like bars and clubs and so forth where you would have, um, they had to be secret or had to be held without the police intervention. <clears throat> or, or without blowing their cover, so to speak. And one of these was um, a gay bar in, in Greenwich Village, you can actually go to today, um, <clears throat> called the Stonewall Inn. So in the 1960s, the Stonewall Inn was raided often by New York Police Department, and NYPD would go in and often threaten to, um, or as a form of extortion, threaten to, um, in, to raid the business, 
but um, expect some kind of a payoff from the, the owners or bartenders or otherwise to not raid. In other words, it's a kind of police corruption um, where in same sex meeting places often had to pay some kind of uh, extortion to the police for them to not be raided. And so this kind of corruption was something that um, same-sex meeting places were, were, were subject to in the 1960s. <clears throat> and the sort of precipitous moment is that in, in July 28th, 1969, on a hot summer night in, um, in New York, um, it, the police raid Stonewall and instead uh, they're met with, in, instead of just doing a roundup and, and, and taking people away, they're met with a violent response. And this response of um, indignation um, was, was mixed. It was from um, gay men, lesbian women, transgender persons. Um, and ultimately, they uh, band together and in an unusual turn of events, trapped the police inside Stonewall um, and began in, uh, rioting outside of it. In other words, and they cut the, the phone lines so that the police couldn't contact for or call for backup. So in other words, we begin to see this moment was a precipitous moment. They were joined by neighbors who saw police extortion against them as a form of, of violence that was completely unjustified. And so against the LGBTQ community. So they were joined by working class neighbors. They were joined by people of color. They were joined by other coalitions of people or who were sympathizing with the fact of, that the NYPD at that time was extorting um, uh, this business, or uh, largely the LGBTQ communities, um, and, and saw that it was a great injustice. <clears throat> so this sparked three days of protest in New York, um, in, and it sparked what we understood to be called the, the, the gay liberation movement. And this is the origin of pride, the pride parades that um, in, are celebrated annually on July 28th or around that date. Gay pride, which aims to overturn shame. This is precisely the origin of that moment. Here we see some images of the Stonewall riots and the gay liberation movement. Um, and we also see um, in the lower right hand corner, uh, Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera, who are both uh, trans women of color, um, who um, Marsha <clears throat> um, as a woman of color in uh, Silvia Rivera, uh, born in Puerto Rico um, and of Hispanic origin, um, is there were two trans women who were activists and founded the STAR movement, which is um, street transvestite action revolutionaries, and housed other trans women and sex workers who would otherwise be on the streets and um, who were subject to violence, police extortion, um, and so on. In other words, it was a politically um, uh, is a politically very much of a, a network of, of support system in, that we see um, in New York at the time. Um, they were fundamental in the Stonewall riots and also in the gay liberation struggle. And yet as trans women, they were also excluded from it. They were marginalized from it. Okay, so what were the effects of Stonewall? Well, the pride protests, ultimately, they were, became an annual event and there were significant, uh, in, throughout the year, there was significant organization. Um, it it uh, in, sort of sparked uh, organization in the LGBTQ communities across uh, the United States and really across the world. It gave a model as well for a kind of activism, a new form of activism for the LGBTQ community. Um, and the pride protests aimed to overturn this notion of closeting, of shame that was associated with a social stigma for LGBTQ people. And so Stonewall became the symbol of this as the origin of it. We also see that the um, demonstrations um, and the, the, the kind of protest that it, was, that it was producing created a space of public appearance as the basis for political action. In other words, that protest, as we see here in the lower right-hand side, come out, join us in the gay liberation front, um, that these demonstrations and actions took to the streets necessarily because they were vying for public visibility and gaining, for e gaining equal rights. And very importantly, the Gay Liberation Front was successful in, in, in um, having the American Psychological Association or the APA 
remove homosexuality from its list of mental illnesses and pathologies um, in 1973. In other words, uh, homosexuality appeared on the books still in 1973 as an illness that could be corrected somehow. Um, it, that's entirely false, and of course it was it finally removed from the books, but the gay liberation struggle was successful in this very um, you know, landmark or watershed moment. Okay, I'd like to end with um, in a brief um, reflection about um, media that we've been talking about. Um, a, you may be familiar, or probably are familiar, with the rainbow flag as a celebration of diversity. It's a very happy symbol, a happy symbol that equates to um, LGBTQ struggles and, and all of those categories of identities being put together in different colorful ways, right? This notion of celebration, of unity, and so on. But in the origins of the LGBT uh, liberation movement or the gay and lesbian liberation movement, there were other symbols that were used. And one of those was the pink triangle. Where does this come from? Here we see on the right hand side here, this actually is taken from, here we are. It's a symbol of the LGBTQ movement that's taken from the concentration camps in World War II. In other words, in, um, in Europe, um, the, thought, the kinds of persecution um, against um, in many subjects, in other words, thinking about the Nazi concentration camps, um, if you were Roma, if you're Gypsy, um, if you were Jewish of an ethnic minority, if you were homosexual, which is what we're talking about now, or if you weren't able-bodied and so on, if you were a, a so-called communist, socialist, in, form, in a red, so to speak, in favor of any kind of democracy, you were potentially an enemy of the fascist state. And these were precisely the subjects who were persecuted um, in, and put in concentration camps in World War II. So, we see in the lower right hand side here in the middle on the right hand side that this image is of um, those concentration camp um, interns who are wearing the pink triangle, uh, which is a symbol of their homosexuality. In other words, they, the prisoners would be labeled. If you were Jewish and also in prison because of, um, or ultimately in a concentration camp because of the uh, homosexuality or a charge of homosexuality, you would be wearing the Star of David and one of those triangles would be pink. In other words, we see that there was a way of marketing, marking prisoners. So after this, in this context, in the wake of the gay liberation movement, um, we begin to see that ACT UP, which is the AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power, um, the activist group, ends up adopting the inverted pink triangle, which was already in use in, among activist organizations, and it became a cultural reference for queer activism, particularly in the HIV AIDS crisis. Why? Well, precisely because there was a link between the negligence of world leaders who were not talking about the epidemic at the time, which equated to death. Right. In other words, not talking about it in public discourse um, contributed to allowing people out of negligence to simply fall ill without treatment or without seeking a cure, without um, public education and prevention programs and so on. And that this was equated to the stigma of allowing the homosexual community um, who is uh, more uh, propense at this time um, to transmission. Um, allowing them simply to um, uh, to die, right? And this this idea of this this shadowing between two times of the concentration camp circumstance and also the 1980s against the HIV/AIDS crisis and inaction by world leaders. So we see, in other words, that queer politics in a form of identity politics it reappropriates. It takes something from a context such as the World War II context and it reappropriates, reappropriates it for the benefit of the collective. In other words, it takes it and it uses it as a symbol, as an aim, and as an identity itself, as a badge of honor. And that's very something that's something that um, it forms part of sort of the history of a queer history of LGBTQ movements, but also HIV AIDS. We see, in other words, that um, um, it takes a derogatory slur, something that, st that stings, like the term queer, and reappropriates it, uh, readapts it into an identity, a symbol of identity for the elect collective. In fact, 
um, there would be posters that would be held by um, protesters saying, we're queer and we're here. And they would have, for instance, the pink triangles, or even with humor, as we say here too, no, not tonight, dear, it's a felony. In other words, no, um, is sexual relations uh, between same-sex partners um, it can't take place because it's a felony still on the books, according to these anti-sodomy anti laws, even though that's defined, um, any kind of same-sex relation was, or homosexuality was defined as, um, as a felony in some states. So what we're seeing simply is to um, in, end this conversation. Um, in a, uh, what we're seeing is a, um, uh, different ways in which media themselves are in, uh, ultimately at play in the social reality of a changing picture of the 1960s and into the early 70s. This is a point of comparison and contrast with Spain. And this also gives us the basis to be able to talk about gender identity, gender expression, uh, and also some of the struggles that were vying for equal rights that are producing their own media, because ultimately cultures of protest also produce a media, even if they're not necessarily mainstream media. And I think that's where we'll end our lecture for today. Um, thanks very much. It's been a, a, a lot to, to work through with these different concepts, but we will continue to work with them in the future. Have a good one. We'll see you next time.